हेलो फ्रेंड्स आई एम डॉक्टर महेश मोहिते पीडियाट्रिशियन पीडियाट्रिक इंटेंसिविस्ट एंड न्यूनेटल इंटेंसिविस्ट फ्रॉम पनवेल महाराष्ट्र कंटिन्यूइंग विथ अवर एजुकेशन थ्रू स्टीयर चैनल आई एम हियर टू प्रेजेंट टुडे सीजर ऑफ फ्राइटनिंग एक्सपीरियंस फ्रेंड्स द डेफिनेशन ऑफ सर्टन थिंग्स लुक स्लाइटली कॉम्प्लिकेटेड सो इज अ सीजर इट्स अ सडन uncontrolled burst of electrical activity in the brain it can cause changes in movements behavior emotions and level of consciousness seizures with body movement so whenever there is a seizure can be sensory motor it can be emotional so when it is associated with body movements or a motor presentation it is called as convulsion which is more kind of a conventional terminology but there can be seizures without overt manifestation patient just looking like unconscious but not having external movements and internally the seizures going on which is called as subclinical seizures a reasonably common scenario in a pediatric critical care unit first of the challenge many times of the patient comes with his child is to know whether it is really a seizure because there are few seizure mimics as well so we need to have a detailed description by an eye witness right from pre seizure during seizure and post seizure what was the behavior so even during the seizure child may be totally conscious especially in a case of partial seizures or focal seizures so we need to go through the detail history if the parents if that person who was witnessed is not available maybe you can talk to him on phone or if possible call him for a one is to one conversation we need to rule out certain mimics commonly being syncope migraine fainting panic attacks vertigo stroke etc which we will be discussing in very other various other steer videos the video recording is something which is new that every patient whenever they are in doubt whenever we are in doubt we insist that they should record an event and bring it because if we as a doctor see that we can really get ourselves convinced that it is a seizure and proceed with further evaluations and management there are certain things which go against an event of seizure on the history like if the child had closed the eyes during the event that is one point strongly against it if the child had vibratory movement rather than jerky movement why are only pelvic thrusting movements which is unlikely to be seizure and arrhythmic progressive upper limb to lower limb movement there is something which is again technical but i would say once if the child has closed the eyes or a child is having thrusting pelvic movement those are unlike little be seizure what are the common causes probably in the pediatric age group special in the children less than 4 to 5 years most common is being febrile seizure the simple febrile seizure the typical febrile seizure which would appear usually on the first day or second day of fever usually at the spike of the fever a single event of the seizure lasting for not more than 15 to 20 minutes no focal seizure post tictally child quickly gets out there are features which are hinting towards sinister underlying pathology which denote this as a a typical seizure and the feature is being prolonged seizure more than 20 minute may be coming like a febrile status epilepticus or a focal seizure or multiple seizures in the one febrile disease they all will hint towards a typical seizure and they will hint towards probable underlying sinister pathology and may require anti epileptic drug subsequently the first unprovoked seizure when it comes to you age is very important smaller the child more likely there is underlying pathology a secondary seizure and bigger the child more likely it could be idiopathic seizure that brings to your gross classification of the seizure being idiopathic seizure where the exact cause is not known even after evaluation and symptomatic seizure being there is some underlying cause and when we talk about symptomatic seizure it could be acute symptomatic like a meningitis encephalitis or hyponatremia the metabolic problems hyponatremia hypocalcemia etc or a trauma where there is a injury to the brain and seizure immediately vis a vis there could be a remote symptomatic where there was some injury in the past and after a quiescent period of asymptomaticness the child will seizure after few months or few years typically a cp child or hibb hypoxic ischemic encephalitis at brain convulsed for first 2 to 3 days then was a febrile or a seizure no seizure for 3 4 months 
just to start seizuring again after six months so this kind of a thing or some kind of a cerebral malformation which comes up with a late symptomatic seizure so these are rather remote symptomatic epilepsy they are symptomatic and provide so when it comes to symptomatic or provoked seizure we need to go through detail history and try to find out the cause so we have to go through the history before during or after seizure what somebody observed so you can find out if there is a features of encephalopathy so altered sensorium headache vomiting prior to that features of raised ICT in the form of headache vomiting or a neuro deficit prior to that or delayed development in the past they all will hint towards a chronic or underlying pathology there during seizure if there are focal seizures obviously you know it's probably a symptomatic seizure or something underneath and post seizure if there is prolonged drowsiness or prolonged deficit which one should be extremely careful i'll give a simple example recently we saw a child typical two years old brought with a febrile seizure seemingly apparently typical febrile seizure but after giving a loras dose the child didn't get up for next two or three hours which made us a first alarm and then the dtr deep tendon reflexes were exaggerated we quickly sent this patient to the MRI and to our surprise or probably we expected there was acute necrotizing encephalitis and child required a vigorous kind of a immunotherapy treatment to salvage him. So we need to be careful to find out what is not typical seizure and we should be really aggressive working to evaluate and treat that patient. These categories which are symptomatic they need aggressive evaluation to know the underlying cause. At the same time there could be some systemic causes of seizure in the form of hypertensive encephalopathy, hypoxia, shock or toxins and abnormalities which also can give rise to seizure. How do we respond in the emergency? So some of the child you find seizuring either at home or in the clinic, how do we do it? We need to treat, do we need to treat all the seizures? Physiologically, the brain is trained to control most of the seizures within first three to five minutes and those are the ones who may not require any treatment. So there is a concept called as T1 and T2. T1 is a time beyond which if the seizure continues, it's unlikely to stop of its own and requires therapy. And T2 is a time if the seizure continues beyond this time, there is a likelihood of permanent or long-term brain damage. And this T1 and T2 varies for various seizures like typical generalized chronic clonic seizures. T1 is about 5 minutes and T2 is about 30 minutes. Vis a vis focal seizures, it may be 10 to 15 minutes as a T1 and more than one hour as T2. Absence seizure could be again a prolonged period. So we need to understand this and then treat accordingly. What is status epilepticus? So you have the seizures as seizure, status epilepticus, refractory status epilepticus, super refractory status, we need to understand this terminology. So status is any seizure, a child brought seizure into the clinic or seizure more than five minutes. Why? Because anything beyond that has a potential to damage the brain permanently what is and uh, when you call it as refractory status once it goes beyond one hour in spite of giving two primary drugs like by and large we'll use benzodiazepines and phenytoin or multiple other drugs like valparin or maybe a kind of a phenytoin valparin nowadays we use levetiracetam so we have used benzodiazepine with one of these other three drugs then we label it as refractory status it goes beyond one hour and then the chances of this getting controlled is lesser so we need to be very aggressive with iv anesthetic drugs and he will essentially require icu management because he may require ventilation and hemodynamic support why it is important to categorize i told you if it goes beyond that time then there is risk further increases and it may take more and more support to control this control measures at home if the start child starts seizuring at home then one should try and give inhaled midazolam as per the kind of a uh, advice given by your practitioner we need to position the child so as to avoid the aspiration keep the child in the head low and one lateral position if the child was eating during the time then try to remove that food particles from the mouth to avoid aspiration and then as soon as possible safely transport the child to emergency room and the, during that time try to get a medical assistance if preferably in an ambulance at, at the higher center obviously will be stabilizing his airway breathing uh, circulatory kind of a support while managing the seizure. Once in the medical facility, we again initially we try and give midazolam or the first line will give lorazepam which will be preferably given IV once in the hospital. Second line could be phenytoin or levetiracetam or valparin depending upon the clinical condition. Nowadays we use levetiracetam as a choice drug. What response to expect after this treatment? Stoppage of seizure after medication immediately, improved 
GCS within one hour and if there is no improvement within one hour of the GCS, be alert and try to evaluate further. Maybe in a given scenario, you may have to do EG to rule out subclinical seizure. If you miss this for a prolonged period, then child may land up with brain death. What are the red flags in seizure? So, let's say you come across a child with seizure, we need to find out if there is anything sinister. So, those are the red flag for underlying cause. So, if there is a preceding feature of encephalopathy or encephalitis, there is a past history of neurological disorder like a delayed development, neurocutaneous markers, abnormal birth history, or there is a positive family history of seizure, there is a preceding history suggestive of raised intracranial pressure, there is a history of toxic consumption, there is a history of preceding history of abnormal behavior or neuropsychiatric or autoimmune disorders are likely in this case. These all patients will require a detailed further evaluation. Who needs further evaluation? Obviously, all with those red flags, all with status or refractory status epilepticus, all suspected subclinical seizures with a continuous EG monitoring. So, those are the ones who definitely require detailed evaluation. And what those evaluation could be? They could be a metabolic investigation like calcium, magnesium, sodium, rest of the electrolytes, case specific like toxin workups or drug levels. CSF you may require if there is a suspecting infection when the child is a bit stable and ICP raise ICP ruled out, CSF may be required. Now it is missing lot of autoimmune kind of a CNS markers where CSF may be required and EEG and SOS neuroimaging based on the case. When do we need to take a neurological consult? All seizures without obvious cause, all with sinister underlying cause, refractory or recurrent seizures, abnormal neuroimaging or toxin screen suspected genetic causes, they all will require a neurological consult. So friends, to summarize, seizure is a potentially serious neurological emergency. It can represent a neurological or generalized disease like hypoxia or shock. Subclinical seizures are far more dangerous and need to be picked up, at least suspected and picked up as early as possible to prevent the tragedy subsequently. Early control of seizure will prevent long-term permanent neurological damage. Thank you very much friends and next talk will be given by Dr. Tushar Maniar on abnormal movements. Thank you very much.